Awesome. Well, they were right on top of that mic for you. You were like, as soon as you were done praying, it was cut off. <laughs> well, thank you, Wes, Elijah, for that. As the uh, kids continue back there. Um, we are going to continue our... Uh, we're going to continue going through the, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, and we're going to finish up chapter 14 today. And uh, we've been on this, um, on this, uh, Paul's been talking about this comparison of speaking in tongues and prophecy. He specifically is. Um, he he's specifically coming out with that uh, that particular gift, as he refers to it, of speaking in tongues, um, and and has quite a bit to say about it. Um, we're we're going to see where he concludes with it today, and we're going to do a little bit of a review. The last, um, the last few weeks, we've we, we've covered a few uh, of these topics. Um, go to the next one, or is it all frozen? There we go. Okay, First Corinthians chapter twelve, uh, verse four. As we do this review, um, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. And uh, so as, as we see in this one, that there is a, uh, that, that each person is receiving something from the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, th this isn't working. So I can't see what's coming next. <laughs> so just go to the next one. Follow the cues, man. Yeah, I know he's brand new. If I speak in human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And so we're seeing that, that uh, th there's a gift that is given to us. Each and every one of us receives something from the Spirit. Each and every one of us receives something uh, to do with, to build the kingdom of God. But he says that uh, if I, he goes into chapter 13, but if I use these gifts like, like angelic tongues, or if I, uh, it, but if I don't have love, I I'm noise. It doesn't mean anything. Even if I have the gift of prophecy, but do not have love, it means nothing. I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions over, and, but I do not have love, then I gain nothing. So not, if without love, then our gifts mean absolutely nothing. And so as we continue to go through uh, chapter 13 and 14, he says, Therefore, the person who speaks in another tongue should pray that he can interpret and if I pray in another tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing praise with the spirit and I will also sing praise with my understanding. Hey, it's working now. So what we see is that that uh, that using this gift, he's, he switched back and he had talked about love. And now he's back to this gift of tongues because... There is something going on in the church that is going on with this gift. And, and, I, and I, as I said last week, you know, we often want to take what we're experiencing with this gift and what we call the gift of tongues and put it on them. But that's not the case. There's something else going on with them and we need to take what's going on with them and bring it into how does it apply to us. And so... 
he's not he's not talking about the gift of tongues as we understand it. There's something else going on, and and as I said, there was there's probably three possibilities as to what's going on. Is one that you do have spiritual utterances that are brought in by the pagan gods coming into the church. Two that they're trying to preserve the the Hebrew that. Um, that you have some who are saying the Old Testament, or they would have just called it the Scriptures, are written in Hebrew. So the only way we can get the true meaning is if we read it and speak it in Hebrew. And if we pray in Hebrew and all of those things, because they would have prayed the prayers of the Psalms and all of those kind of things. So if they're praying in Hebrew and then other people can't understand it, especially the Greeks. Or the third option is that God is still using the Holy Spirit and manifesting in people this gift of tongues where they can speak in other languages because other languages would be involved in the church. And so that the Holy Spirit is doing that. And so you have people who are speaking in languages, but they're not doing it with interpreters and these sorts of things that are going on. So those three things is probably what is happening in the in Corinth. One of those three things or a combination of all three of those is happening in Corinth as we're going to see as we will finish off today. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1, this is what he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. So the whole thing is that we have to pursue love, we desire spiritual gifts, and especially that we may proclaim the gospel. He finishes off, and what we'll finish off with is 1 Corinthians 14, 12 where he said, so also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to excel in building up the church. The whole point of what Paul is trying to get across in chapters 12, 13, and 14 is this, to excel in building up the church. If we focus on the other things, if we focus on... Uh, you know, what, what is this gift of tongues? And, and we can have that discussion, but that discussion should always be based around one thing. What are, are we building up the church? Or are we destroying or, or tearing down the church? Because what we should be zealous for, Christians, what we should strive after, what we should desire more than anything, spiritual gifts that seek to excel in building up the church. That's what we should be about. That's what we should be doing. Which is one of the reasons why we have said our mission statement is building a community of devoted Christ followers. To build something up. Which is what we are called to do. No matter what we believe on what is the gift of tongues. Should it be used in church? Shouldn't it be used in church? How should it be used? Is it, is it preservation? Is it spiritual utterances? Is it, uh, is it uh, that, that the Holy Spirit was doing something extra? It doesn't matter. What does matter is this. Is that we seek to build up the church. We can have those discussions so that we can have clarity and we can have understanding in what's going on in Corinth. But ultimately, what we should be about is not fighting with each other or bickering with each other, but that we are building the church. And we're using our spiritual gifts to do so. So I'm going to let's pray and then we'll continue on in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 40. Father God. We thank you for all that you do, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will fill us here at this moment with your spirit so that we may understand the importance of building each other up. That we may understand how we function in that. That you are giving each and every one of us in here a portion, a manifestation, so that we can be a part of building the church, Lord. God, I pray that you'll speak to each and every one of us. We thank you and we praise you in your son's precious name. Amen. So we're going to continue in uh, chapter 14, verses 26 through 40 today.
after he said all that, he's going to jump in and he's going to say this in verse 26. What then, brothers and sisters? Whenever you come together, each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, another tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is to be done for building up. If anyone, sp if anyone speaks in another tongue, there are only two or at most three, each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no interpreter, that person is to keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak. The others should evaluate. But if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. The prophet's spirits are subject to the prophets, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. We're going to go back and, and look at that because I, I, I bolded some of, the, uh, some of the words for you that we're going to go back and look at. But what I want you to see is that what happens in church should be for the building up of the church so that everyone may learn and be encouraged. What happens in church should be that everyone can learn and be encouraged. We don't, we don't just want one group to learn. We don't just want one specific group of people to learn. We don't want just a certain number of people to be encouraged. The, the, the purpose of the church is that everyone can come and learn and that everyone can be encouraged. And that, that, that means that's not only just for the saved people, it's anyone who walks through those doors may learn from us and be encouraged at any point in time. This is the point of church. If the church can't do this, then what's the point of church? If the church can't be a place where people come and learn and be encouraged, what is the point? What are we doing? If we're not learning anything, if we're not growing in our walk with Jesus Christ, if we're not encouraged to keep that up, if we're not encouraged um, in, in spirit, if we're, if we're not going to say, I could do this, I can make it through my week because I've been around the body of believers, then what's the point? Is this, are we a social club? We shouldn't be. Are, are, we, are we just so that we can show off our, 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 our latest uh, fashion that we got? We shouldn't be. It should be that we encourage each other. That we learn. That we grow in our walk daily with Jesus Christ, and that the body helps in that. I want to go back and look at this passage of Scripture. We'll, we'll, we'll start there in verse 26, where he says, Whenever you come together, sure there's a hymn, there's teaching, there's revelation, another tongue, or an interpretation, but why? The why is so that everything is to be done for the building up. Why do we sing hymns? Why did Wes and Elijah sing those songs or, or play those songs this morning? Was it so that we can uh, hear how good they are on their instruments? How, how good of a voice Wes has? Although those things are true, that's not why we do it. I know, I know Wes's heart, he doesn't come up here and sing songs so that he can, he can hear himself or so that you can hear him and so that he has an audience because he wants to be a famous rock star someday. That's not why he does it. He does it because he wants you to be encouraged by the words that are on the screen and express that through song because music 
changes our emotion. It changes uh, it, it, scientifically. There's it's there's a chemical thing that happens in our brains that when we sing and it brings us closer to God because God designed it that way, so that we are encouraged, so that we can see that He is my vision. Be thou my vision. And we're encouraged in that. We're strengthened in that. We place that on our hearts. That's why we, we bring hymns and we sing. And that's why there's teaching and revelation. And that's why there should be tongues if there's going to be tongues. Is for what? For everything is to be done for the building up. Not the tearing down. Sermons shouldn't be preached. Uh, and, and, and maybe you've ever been at that where, where sermons, I don't preach sermons to tear you down. I don't preach sermons because, oh, you know what? I heard somebody's dealing with the sin issue. I heard that person is doing this. So this Sunday, I'm going to stick it to them. We don't do that. We shouldn't do that. I know it's been done. But hopefully, and my prayer is always that you're encouraged by what is preached. That you, you, you learn from it. Not to tear you down, but to build you up. Sometimes I, people will say, well, you were stepping all over my toes. Well, that's okay. Hopefully, you're not running from it, but you're learning from it. Hopefully the Spirit is saying to you, hey, this is something that you are, are dealing with, that, that He's preaching, and we're, we're going to move past this. We're going, we're going to move through this. Why do we get together? Everything is to be done for the building up. Let's go uh, to, the, to the next one, and, and where he says in verse 31, he says, for you can all prophesy one by one, so that... Everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. Why are we doing this? So that everyone can learn and everyone can be encouraged. Because look, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. I want you to remember that for the, the verse 33. Make a little note of it right there. Because we're going to come back to that in just a moment. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. We don't serve a God of chaos. We serve a God of order. I mean, if I were to ask you, did God create the universe? You would probably tell me yes. And so if we look at that from that angle, everything... Just looking at our solar system, everything is spinning so perfectly. The sun rises, the sun's it's it's so orderly that we can tell that they can tell you when the sun is going to rise and when it's going to set and how the time changes when it does that. It's so orderly that we can calculate that for the next million years and for furthermore, because it's so orderly. Which means that we can go backwards with it and calculate the exact position of the sun on certain days at certain times. Going back as far as you want. It's orderly. Our God is a God of order. Not a God of disorder. So if you're in a church that is disorderly, it's not godly. Because our God is a God of order. And why? Because order is what encourages people. Order is what builds people up. Chaos tears down. Chaos destroys. Order builds. Here's an example. If we're going to build a house. Some of you may have been contractors. At some point in time, there's an order for doing things to get that house built. Okay, you can't have the painters show up 
on the day that they're laying concrete. Because there's nothing to paint, right? There's an order. So you got to lay things. You got to do certain things first. You got to build certain things. When the walls are, before you put up the sheetrock, you got to put in the electrical lines, all of that. There's an order to building. So once it's built, there was an order. But if I take dynamite and throw it in, chaos. See, what is order builds, chaos destroys. And, you, and I know what you're thinking. This man says, I know every analogy falls apart because you know I, you know what I'd be thinking if I was you. I can orderly take it apart. That's true. We could do that. But you understand the example that order builds it, chaos will take it down. The same is true in the church. Order will build it, chaos will take it down. Structure builds, chaos will destroy. And so we do this church, we do this thing church because we want everyone to learn that everyone might be encouraged. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24, it says, And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting the gathering together, as some are in a habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The assembling of one another is meant to encourage each other and to watch out for one another. See, let's look at this verse again in Hebrews. He says, let us watch out for one another to do what? Promote love and good works, which is what Paul has already said in 1 Corinthians, that without love, that I'm nothing. So we, we, we do these things to promote and to provoke love and good works among each other. Not neglecting the gathering together. Now, I, I want to say this. Sometimes we use this verse as to, to people who we know should be in church, and we might say it to them. Please don't do that. Because that's discouraging. Well, you should be in church. I know I should be in church. The Bible says, don't neglect the gathering of each other. Don't neglect the gathering of one another. Don't neglect to gather. However you want to say it. Please don't do that, because that's discouraging, not encouraging. Encouraging would say, we would love to have you, and I know that our, our, our small group, our community group, or our Sunday school, or our church would love to see you there so that we can pour into your life and we can build you up in your faith. Because that's what the Scripture says we're there for, is to build you up. We would love to be a part of building you up. Because look at what he says. Don't neglect to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. Why? Because encouraging each other all the more. We can't do that if people aren't here. So, so it's, it's kind of this two-way street where the church is here, but you also have to be. And I know that there are people like, well, I could worship wherever, I can do wherever. And, and I, I get that sentiment. You know, you can worship God in a deer stand. That's true. You can. And, and as we're getting closer to deer season, I understand. It's fun. It's great to be out there. Get you some meat for the next year. I'm all for it. And missing a Sunday isn't going to, to, to ruin everything. But if we don't come together then we don't get that encouragement. Which is kind of my, my, my big fear as we've walked through this last year and a half. We have people who are not encouraged. And I understand there's some people who can't be here. I get that. And we've provided a way that they can be a part and they can watch the sermon. And they, can, they can still interact a little bit. And we have people watching online right now, I'm sure. And... We, it's great that we live in a day and age where we can do that and we can have that technology. But it's not the same. It's not the excuse. Well, I can just stay home, so I will. That's not the gathering together. We can't encourage each other because what we're supposed to do is come together and say, how can I pray for you this week? 
How, how can I lift you up this week? Hey, how about you and I get together this week and we'll have lunch or, or breakfast or something and we'll encourage one another in the word. Because the church is about building each other up. We don't neglect coming and meeting with the church because if we do that, then we don't get that encouragement. We don't get built up. We don't get what we're supposed to from each other. And so what we see here, what, what Paul is, is laying out to the, the church in Corinth is that if, if they're going to meet together, then it needs to be orderly and it needs to be about encouragement. So what does that mean for us? That if we are going to meet together as Hillside Baptist Church, then it has to be orderly and it's about encouraging each other. That it's not chaos and disorder. So what we're going to go into next is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse, the second part of verse 33. This is also one of those passages that has been taken way out of context of what Paul is trying to say. And is one of those passages that can make us feel uncomfortable. So we're going to go through this uh, uh, quickly, uh, and we're going to see what, what Paul is trying to say because it has been used in the wrong ways. So as he says, he says, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to submit themselves as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, since it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Or did the word of God originate from you? Or did it come from you only? Okay, good. No arrows were hurled at me. Okay. I want us to, to understand what's going on. Because if we understand what's happening in the church of Corinth, this will make a lot more sense. If I just take this verse and I say, hey, I'm going to teach a women's ministry class. And, the ver and everybody's like, great. And so we get all of our women together and we sit them down in, in, at the tables in the fellowship hall. And this is where I start. That class probably isn't going to last too long. Okay. They're going to say, oh, see, Paul is, uh, Paul is sexist. Paul is a bigot. But I want us to understand what is being said and what's going on. Because we have to take it in context of the whole, right? We can't just take those verses and say, well, th this is what he means. So we have to go all the way back to um, w w where we're going to go. Is we're going to go all the way back to uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3. Because this is one of those passages that if we don't know what's going on, we'll misinterpret the passage. And if you, if you remember all the way back in chapter 11, it says... Paul wrote this, says, but I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of every woman and that God is the head of Christ. And every man who prays or prophecies with something on his head dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophecies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. Now, remember, there are two things in this passage, the head covering we, we talked about this. I'm just giving you a review. The head covering in this passage is not a symbol of oppression, but is a symbol of liberation for women because the role and the responsibility of church does not fall to women. Okay, we said that because we talked about roles and responsibilities and, and elders and deacons as, as what he was saying was going on. And in this passage, he says, remember, Christ is the source of every man and man is the source of woman because that's where woman came from. She came from Adam's rib and she was uh, produced uh, because God is interacted and produced a perfect helpmate for the man. And so she comes from man. God is the head of Christ. God is the source. Okay. So it's all talking about source, not authority. Okay. But the authority comes when she understands that because of her role as the helpmate, it's, we're relating this back to church. And so as the 
as the church, what then would be said is that the, the role and responsibility of the church, of the growing, of everything that happens in the church does not fall to her, which means that when the judgment comes of did the church succeed or did the church fail, it's not going to fall on her, it's going to fall on him. Because that's his role. That's his responsibility. So we need to keep that in mind when we're, when we're talking about this. Be, and the second thing is, is that every woman who prays or prophecies with her head uncovered. Now, here's what I want to say is that Paul doesn't have a problem with women praying and prophesying in church. He's not taking issue with that. All he's saying is that the symbol of authority is on her head. Because it's the custom of their time. Every religion around the world and every religion at that time, women's heads were covered. So for us, it's different because we haven't required that for quite some time. There are still denominations that require that. But for the most part, in, in the United States, in the Western world, that has not been the requirement. That symbol doesn't need to be there. So that's why we don't ask, why don't women have their head covers? He's dealing with a cultural issue, but we have to understand what he is saying. What he is saying is that there is a liberation for women because the responsibility is not there. It's not going to fall to them. That's given to men. So men, this is a statement of step up and do what you're called to do for the church. Be the authority, not the authority of oppression, but the authority of a liberation of liberation. So as we we covered that weeks ago. And uh, if you want to go back and, and find that you can, uh, it's in our archives on YouTube. You can go back and, and, and watch that one. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But what does happen is that with, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in, in verse 33 there. We have to ask this question. What is happening in the church that Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians 14, 34? Women should be silent in churches. They are not permitted to speak, but are to submit themselves, as the law also says. Which many believe that that was a law in Corinth, not a law in the church. So what is going on here? Remember what was said in the first part of 33, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Verse 36 indicates that the church in Corinth is practicing something that is disorderly. As he said there, or did the word of God originate from you, or did it come to you only? That's, a, that's him admonishing them for doing a practice that no other church does, and them saying, oh, it's fine. What is the practice? We can't be certain, because he doesn't specifically address it. But it would be something that they would have known exactly what he was talking about to the letter. They would have known, oh, this is exactly what he's talking about. So what we have is we have scholars who have said, well, we can kind of probably understand what is happening, but we can't know every detail. What is happening is that, that they're, they're practicing something that is disorderly. And this will cause confusion, factions, and dissensions. So more than likely what is happening is there, there is a group of women who are questioning and challenging prophecy, that's the foretelling, in the church's gatherings. 
See, we know a few things about Corinth. We know that, that there are some women who are rebelling against certain things, and, and Paul has already covered some things because there's these group of women who are saying, well, it's not proper for women to lay with their husbands because now we're supposed to be the wife of Christ and all of these things. And so they're, they're creating all this disorderly, and there's this, we know that there's this group of women who are, who are doing and saying certain things, which is why he's addressing head coverings, which is why he's addressing certain issues because there is uh, certain groups that are causing problems. So what's probably happening here is that you have a certain group who is causing a problem in the church and Paul is going to correct it. And if we look back there on 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 33, when we see that, then he, he's saying that the women should be silent in churches for they are not permitted to speak, but to submit themselves as the law also says. So there's a law that's, that's in Corinth that probably has this, but what he's telling them is they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. See, I want you to understand that this is a practice that we're already doing. I don't stand up here and preach and somebody stands up and says, Hey, pe preacher, I got a question on what you just said. And then I've got to address that issue in front of the whole congregation. Then I preach something else and then somebody else stands up and says, Hey, preacher, wait a second. Hold on. But if you say that, then and all the way back in Deuteronomy 2018, which I don't know right off the head, right off my head what that says. So somebody was going to look. But if uh, it says this over here. And then I have to address that issue. See, we don't do that. Why? Because that's disorderly. But that's the belief of what's going on in Corinth is that the men are getting up there to prophesy and they're, they're, which is the foretelling. So they're preaching. They're saying, this is what the scripture says. This is what I learned this week. This is what the spirit uh, spoke to me this week. And as they're preaching, wait, wait, wait a second. That's not how I read that. That's not how I interpret that. That's not what the spirit says to me. See, there's disorder. So if we look through that context and we see, wait a second, what is he saying? He's not saying that women are repressed and should be kept silent in church. What he is saying is that order has to happen. Because we don't have a God of disorder. And if he says this, then they're going to know, okay, this group of women who are causing disruptions, who are, who are irritating the, 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 the pre people who are preaching and they're, they're disrupting and they're, they're causing disorder. They need to be silent. And Paul says, hey, y'all need to sit down. If you have a question, you can ask later. Okay? Now, I'm not telling you that. I'm not. That's what Paul is saying to them. So, we already practice this. We already have this going. And so if we're reading this, well, well Paul, is, Paul is being oppressive to women. Remember that in the whole, the whole thing, if we take the whole context of Scripture, we see that the Bible liberates women rather than oppresses them. God uses women to do amazing things in Scripture. The, this, what Paul is saying is not meant to say, hey, if you're a woman... Sit down, shut up, and don't say anything. Let the big boy speak, okay? That's not what he's saying. Because we already have women prophesying and praying in church, and he doesn't have a problem with it. But if it's disruptive, which this particular group of women in Corinth is being disruptive, then we have a problem. Then we have to settle it down. Then the, the, what's disruptive will bring harm to the church. So Paul is dealing with an issue that is disruptive and harmful to the church and not oppressive to women. So I want you to hear that. And if you want to come and talk about that further, we can. But that's what's going on. That's what's What's, what's being dealt with. We don't know the exact issue. We don't know exactly who these women were. We don't know these things. But what we do know is that in the character of what Paul has been saying from chapter 1 all the way up to this point, what he said in chapter 11 
what he is telling them here in chapter 14 is that there has to be order because we're about encouraging and building up the church and not tearing it down. And if we have disorder in the church, which is apparently happening in Corinth, you're going to destroy things. You're going to tear it down. And so as we move on from there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should recognize that what I write to you is the Lord's command. If anyone ignores this, he will be ignored. So then, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in other tongues. But everything is to be done decently and in order. God has called us to be orderly in our worship, to avoid confusion, so that the gospel will do the task of saving souls. See, we should be about nothing else. Building each other up and the salvation of souls. See, we as Christians should want those outside the church to experience what's happening inside the church. Because what should be happening inside the church is that people's needs are met. People are spiritually growing. They're coming to an understanding of God and who he is. They're encouraged to uh, face the day. They're encouraged in the time of trouble, in the time of famine. And that the people who are in the church are experiencing the joy of God. See, this is what should be going on in here. And we should want those who are out there to know. But if we, they come in here and it's disorderly and one group is doing their thing, another group is doing their own thing, they don't know each other, they don't talk with each other. If when they come in, there's, there's no encouragement and there's no learning. There's no building up. Why would they stay? Why would they want to be a part of that? Would you want to be a part of that? I wouldn't. I would want to be a part of something that's orderly, that encourages and so we have to ask ourselves in the, everything that we do and the things that we're doing is, are we doing the things that are orderly? Are we doing the things that encourage people? Let's go back and look at this passage of Scripture there in verse 37. So that anyone who thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, what I write, you should understand that. If you ignore that what Paul has written then he will be ignored, whether either by Paul or by God. He says, so then, brothers and sisters, listen, be eager to prophesy. Meaning, be eager to share the gospel. Be eager to claim the truths that are found in God's word. Be eager to say these things. He settles on do not forbid speaking in other tongues. Once again, it doesn't matter what we believe. What we believe on that, what that is. For them and for us, I, I would say mostly it's probably going to be that we don't, we don't forbid the gospel to be preached in other languages. As some are accustomed to doing. Some have said, don't, don't, don't withhold and say, well, this is the only interpretation of God's word. We're setting ourselves in. We're forbidding certain things. Don't forbid. As long as it's biblical. As long as it's what he has said. Interpreters, two or three, 
three at most is what he said. Has to be interpretation. It has to be uplifting. It has to be building. All of those things. Be eager to prophesy. It's the greater gift. Do not forbid. But in everything. But everything is to be done decently and in order. This is the whole point of chapter 14. Chapter 12 was to establish that there are gifts that we all have them. Verse thir- or chapter 13 says that we have to use our gifts in love. Chapter 14 says that we use those gifts that God is giving us in love to create order and encouragement of one another. Those are the chapters laid out for you. So if you're writing a paper on it, go ahead. I want to look at one more passage in Deuteronomy chapter 28, 20. Where he says, the Lord will send against you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you do until you are destroyed and quickly perish because of the wickedness of your actions in abandoning me. Here's what I want you to connect. You say, wow, this is kind of a bleak passage to end on, Pastor. Here's what I want you to connect. When people are confused about their role and others' roles and and the emphasis is put on the wrong gifts, then the organization will perish. If that's where we are as a church, we won't make it. If... If we're, if we're about confusion and we put the wrong emphasis on the wrong roles, we won't make it. Because God has called us to orderly, to orderly worship. That's what it means is this orderly worship that we come together and we emphasize the building up of the church. That we are building each other, supporting each other, We are thinking as others as more important than ourselves. Because this is what we've been called to as the church. If we can do this, then we will build a community of devoted Christ followers. We will be about that. That's my hope for us. That's my prayer for us, is that we can grasp onto that, that we want to do everything so that we are building people up. That everything we do is about building people, is about building the body, is about building the community, is about strengthening each other. That we love one another as Christ loved us. I didn't want to I I didn't want to say, well, we're going to end on this bleakness, but that we understand that this is what happens when chaos and disorder comes into the church. And that we will take hold of chaos and disorder and say we will not allow that here, but that we will practice orderly worship so that we can build the next generation that will build the next generation that will build the next generation. That we will lay that foundation to continue the building of the community. I'm going to ask them to come and play. If you're a person who's sitting there today and you say, well, I know that I'm saved. But I haven't been part of building. Then I'd love for you to have that conversation with God and say, God. Where do I need to participate so that I can be part of building and encouraging other believers? I'd love for you to have that conversation. Maybe your person says, well, I know that I'm a part of that. Maybe you can have this conversation, God. I'm pretty sure that I'm building. I know that I'm building. Can you strengthen me so that I can be better? So I can be stronger. 
Maybe you're a person who's sitting there today who says, I've never known Jesus. I don't know who he is. Something's speaking to me. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to share with you how you can come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We're going to take just the next few moments with our eyes closed, head bound, so that we eliminate distractions. Not so that you're comfortable with people aren't looking at you. But that we eliminate distractions and we just have that conversation with God. However he's working in our inside us, however he's speaking to your heart. That you'd say, God, I'm here. Speak to me. Just take the next few moments. Silent prayer and say, God speak to me.